Okay, so we will uh, have the last uh, uh, talk of this conference, and it is a pleasure to introduce uh, Emmanuel Breuer from Münster, who will talk about entropy, Mahler measure, and Bernoulli convolutions. Okay. Um, okay, so, uh, so first of all, I, I would like to thank uh, the organizers and Jean Bourguin for this uh, opportunity um, to talk here. I'm, of course, deeply honored to be able to speak in front of you and in front of him um, in this event. So, uh, um, yeah, so, I mean, I guess everybody expressed his um, uh, sympathy and his, um, his admiration for, for Jean uh, in, in all the talks that we have heard today. Uh, I would like just to join the chorus and, and uh, to, to say how much I uh, admire the mathematics that um, he put forward and as much, as much as his personality and his kindness. And um, so I guess when I, I came here uh, 10 years ago as a postdoc and I spent a year uh, at the Institute. Um, also Jean was assigned as my uh, uh, tutor. And um, so, so I, I, I went to see him and regularly we would speak about uh, various things. Um, it was nice also for me because we would uh, speak French and this was easier for me to, um, I mean, to get a, a feeling um, with one of the professors there. Uh, and, and, and then after a very event eventful year actually, it was a year where um, the main program was about group theory and representation theory. And uh, it started uh, really uh, very strongly because just a few weeks before the, the, the program started, um, Jean had published a paper with Alex Gambo that completely revolutionized uh, one of the main uh, open problem in, in this area. And uh, so thinking, you know, uh, looking back 10 years, 10 years later, I think this paper had, had been so influential and, and, and we are, we are st I'm still living on this mathematics and <laughs> I'm not the only one. So, um, yes, yeah, so after that year, uh, Jean told me, so um, why don't you come back for another year? And, and uh, then um, I was very glad to be able to come again. And uh, it was a, another special year on additive combinatorics and um, which was again very uh, uh, great for me. So, um, Okay, so I will talk about a joint work with um, Peter Varyu, who, who um, at the time uh, was a graduate student in Princeton, a graduate student of, uh, of Jean, uh, and Elon. And, um, and so, but, uh, so this, uh, what I'm going to talk about now is a recent uh, collaboration. Okay, so, um, but I'll, I'll try to, so in this talk I'll try to uh, retrace the, the somehow the history that sort of led me to this uh, new collaboration with Peter and and um, and this uh, story actually took place back in the day where I was at the Institute 10 years ago so the the, um, the general setting is, a, is a following is very classical setting you have a group G uh, you have a finite generating set uh, symmetric contains identity you look at the power set s to the n so it's the uh, the number the, the set of elements that you can write as a product of uh, at most n elements from the set s and basic question in, in uh, geometry group theory is to understand the, the the cardinality of s to the n as n grow um, so so I'll, I'll focus uh, um, in this talk um, in a special case when, when g is a, a, a just a matrix group and S is a subgroup, is a subset of a uh, finite subset of GLDC, so just a finite number of matrices. And then, um, so in, the, in this context, an interesting uh, um, quantity that uh, you would like to, to look at is this rate of exponential growth. So it's, uh, you, you look at just um, the, the, the S to the N, uh, you look at the cardinality of S to the N to the power of one over N, take the limit, this has a limit because it's sub-multiplicative, and, and you, you'd like to understand this uh, rate. So um, if the rate is bigger than one, then you say that the, um, the group has exponential growth. Okay. So, um, um, 
so th this quantity, so th this fact does not depend on the choice of the generating set. If you change the generating set, you get uh, another, uh, <coughs> you, 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 you get maybe another rate of growth, but the fact that it's bigger than one does not depend on the choice of the generating set. Um, sorry. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, so in, in the special case, when you look at the upper triangular uh, unipotent subgroup, which is just the subgroup of matrices with one on the diagonal and zero below the diagonal, then this is a nilpotent group, and then it's very easy to check, just by uh, just uh, writing down, that the, um, the, the size of S to the N is a polynomial in, in N. Okay, it's a polynomial function of N. Uh, there is a, a celebrated theorem of Jacques Tietz from the 1970s, which uh, is it called the Tietz alternative and has uh, a corollary, uh, um, well-known corollary about group growth. Um, and it, it says that the, this rate of uh, exponential growth, uh, can, so it, it characterizes um, subgroups that have polynomial growth in, in, uh, in uh, GLDC. So, of course, um, so here it says that, in fact, if it's, it has polynomial growth, if and only if it does not have exponential growth, and, and that's if and only if um, the group generated by S has a, a finite index subgroup which is nilpotent, it's, to say this is the same thing as that there is, a, in fact, a finite index subgroup which you can embed in, in the upper triangular matrices. Um, so so um, you're back in the previous example. Um, all right. Uh, so in particular, in for linear groups, you do not have this phenomenon of intermediate growth that uh, Grigorchuk, uh, so these kind of examples that Grigorchuk came up with later on. Um, so, um, yeah, so there, there was a question of Gormov from the 1980s, um, uh, when he came up with this uh, work on hyperbolic groups, um, which is uh, how does this, the, this uh, rate of exponential growth depend on the, the, the set S? How does it depend on S? Um, so if you vary the generating set. Okay, so you, you have a group, you, you vary the generating set, how does it depend? Can it, so the Gromov's question was, can it be bounded away from, from, from one? I uh, suppose you, your group has exponential growth, vary the generating set, can, can it be bounded away from one? Um, uh, so it was, I guess, reasonable to believe that uh, this was, was always true whenever you take a, a group of exponential growth. Counterexamples were found in the early 2000 by John Wilson, um, but these groups are not linear, okay? So these counterexamples. Um, around the same time, Eskin, Moses, and all found um, a, a, a proof, this, so they answer this question affirmatively when you have a, a subgroup of matrices. Uh, so they show that um, if you have exponential growth, then in fact, uh, the, 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 this rate is bounded away from one if you vary the generating set. And indeed, the way they did this was by showing that there exists a universe, uh, there exists some, some, um, some constant n depending only on the group, okay? such that if you vary the generating set in the group, then, um, uh, see, so this n does not depend on the generating set, and s to the n contains two elements, two matrices that generates a free sub group. So if you generate a free sub group, that in particular the s to the capital N little n here is at, is, is two, is at least two to the n, okay? You have two to the n words that are distinct, and you deduce that rho sub s is bigger than two to the one over n, so this, if this capital N depends only on gamma, then this uh, answers the question, can it be, um, uh, is bounded away from, from one. And so, and later on with Zachary Gelander, we, we actually uh, improved this, showing that in this situation, um, if the group, you generate, if the group gamma is not virtually solvable, you can actually uh, make A and B um, uh, be uh, be uh, generators of a free subgroup. So it's a bit better than free semigroup. It's actually quite useful to have a subgroup because you, you have uh, then a sp you get a spectral gap estimates. Uh, so that's that's uh, a good payoff. Okay. So uh, I'll state a conjecture, which um, uh, I 
I guess uh, I came to believe it uh, was going to be true at some point. I don't remember when. But uh, so the, the uniform growth conjecture uh, is that uh, says that, in fact, if you are in GLDC, you fix D, then this exponent, uh, this, sorry, this rate of growth, rho of S, is either one or strictly bigger than one and cannot actually be close to one by, by any, uh, um, so, so the, it's bounded away from one. Uh, uniformly in, the, in, in S, and with, with, so you see the difference with the previous thing here is that here rho of S was depending on this capital N depending on the group gamma. So here I, I'm claiming that in fact it depends on nothing but the dimension. It does not depend on the subgroup. Okay. Um, actually, by the way, there, there's no hope that it depends on, th th that it's completely, that it is an absolute constant. It has to depend on D, so precisely because of these examples of Grigorchuk, uh, th there are examples that very of intermediate growth, and, and so they, they have some linear representations which with very small uh, growth exponent. Um, so, okay, so I'll, I'll get back to this in a second. I, I, I want to, to uh, show you uh, a very, very simple example of two by two matrices that you, you could actually compute and see uh, wh what's going on in this, in this example uh, with respect to, to, uh, to this growth exponent. So you take these two by two matrices, um, they belong to the affine group, they, they are actually, if you look at these two by two matrices acting on, on, uh, on the, the complex line, they are just these two matrices, these two uh, transformations, uh, lambda x plus one and lambda x minus one. Um, and, and uh, it's very simple to compute. Then you know you can compute the ball of radius n. You look, look you have ma you have matrix. You know you take a word of length n, you compute your product, and you see what you've got. Uh, if you take a product of length n, then the everything here will be lambda to the n there, and the unipotent part will be uh, some polynomial in lambda. It's a polynomial with integer coefficients, and and. Um, and, and then it's not difficult to see, for example, that if lambda is root of unity, then it has polynomial growth, and it's vice versa. <coughs> and actually, um, it's, uh, yeah, so it's uh, not difficult to see that, in fact, this, um, this uh, rate is two, unless, unless uh, the, you know, there is a non-trivial relation in between these words uh, in these two transformations. And, and, and uh, this happens if uh, exactly when a lambda is a root of a polynomial with coefficient between minus one, zero, or one. And it's also very easy to see that, um, so in particular, if lambda is transcendental, then O of S sub lambda is two. So the only way you can make this uh, rate small is by asking that lambda is an algebraic number you want it to be small, but not one. So it's an algebraic number, not a root of unity. Um, and, okay, so um, when you compute these polynomials, you, this, uh, these words, uh, you can uh, simply observe, for example, by putting lambda in, in uh, the geometric embedding, looking at the different Galois conjugates of your algebraic number, you see that the, 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 the words of length n, they all live in a certain box, in, in the geometric embedding, and the side lengths of the box are precisely the, um, the, the, the absolute values of the conjugates of your, of your number. So, this means that the, um, the rate is bounded above by uh, what's called the Mahler measure of the algebraic number. Okay. So, so uh, I'll say on the next slide what, what this means. Uh, but um, so here is uh, the definition. So you have a, you have an algebraic number. Algebraic number comes with um, a, uh, a minimal polynomial uh, with integer coefficients. You can factorize it, uh, and you you get the, the roots of the uh, minimal polynomial are all um, uh, are the conjugates of of your uh, algebraic number lambda. And then you can form the, the, the Mahler measure, which is uh, just this, this, this product here. So it's, uh, you have the leading coefficient, and you take the product of the, those conjugates that, are, that lie outside the unit disk, okay? Uh, so, um, yeah, so, so if the Mahler measure is one, 
then this means that uh, all this means that it's an algebraic integer, and all conjugates lie inside the unit disk. And this is equivalent to saying that you have a root of unity. Okay. So if you're not a root of unity, it's strictly bigger than one. Um, if you are, if you, and, uh, if you are a root of unity, it's one. So there is a famous conjecture from the 1930s um, with respect to this Mahler measure, uh, which, which says the following, that they, they ought to be an absolute constant epsilon, such that uh, either the Mahler measure is one or it's bounded away from one. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, actually I think that originally it was asked in the reverse direction. So find examples of um, algebraic numbers that violates this. Um, anyhow, um, there is, this is an open problem. Um, this is an open problem. The, the, the smallest known Mahler measure is, uh, so it's very well studied, uh, I guess, people uh, looked at this problem a lot. Uh, people computed the, the Mahler measure of the, the, you know, the polynomials of, of a small degree, and, uh, and they, they found that actually the, the, the smallest known uh, Mahler measure is this 1.17, and it's um, the, um, corresponding to this uh, minimal polynomial here, or degree 10. Um, so, actually, most algebraic numbers have large Mahler measures. So, it's, it's really about a very tiny set of algebraic numbers for which we don't know if the Mahler measure is bounded away from what. Um, if you're not an algebraic unit, uh, if you are not conjugate to your Galois conjugate to the inverse, uh, you're bounded away from one. If you're totally real, you're bounded away from one. Uh, if, you're sm if you have small Galois group, uh, small meeting, you know, some, some power of the, of, the, of the degree of the extension, then you have, you're bounded away from one. So, um, yeah, so the, the, in, uh, in relation with this conjecture, uh, they, they are two classes of numbers, two important classes of numbers, called the, the Piso numbers on the one hand and, and the Salem numbers on the other hand. So Piso number is an algebraic integer that has all its conjugate strictly inside the unit disk. And, and uh, so itself, of course, because all the others are in, uh, inside the unit disk, so it has to be a real number. It's uh, bigger than one. And so the Mahler measure is uh, just itself in this case. And Siegel showed in the 1940s that uh, Piso numbers cannot approach one. So there is a universal, universal lower bound, there is the smallest one. Um, so, uh, yeah. On the other hand, there is another class, related class of uh, numbers called the Salem numbers. And so those also have all their conjugates inside the unit disk, but not uh, within, just most of them, all of them except one, are uh, on the unit circle. Okay, so um, uh, there is uh, lambda is outside, lambda inverse is inside, but the others are on the unit circle. Uh, so again, the Mahler measure is a, is a number, but for this, for, this, um, for this class, the conjecture is open. Um, uh, we don't know if there are silent numbers that are close to one. So let's go back to, to this uniform growth conjecture. Um, okay. So you see it has a similar form. I, I did it on purpose. It's sort of, there is a similar uh, looking uh, form of the conjecture. It's either one or bounded away from one. And uh, you see that from this uh, tiny, this um, basic uh, baby example of the affine two by two affine matrices, we see immediately that uh, because this is bounded away, this, this weight is bounded above by the mal measure, this uniform growth conjecture implies the lemma conjecture. So um, when I realized this example, I, I thought to myself, well, there's no hope. I'm not going to be able to, to prove anything uh, in this direction. Maybe this is just wrong. Uh, I'm just not uh, looking at the right um, thing. So, um, uh, but um, yeah, but uh, so I was uh, at the time, with, I was at the Institute and uh, I was talking to a lot of people. There was a lot of activity and there was a lot of optimism, a lot of drive. So I, at some point, I, 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 you know, you see all these great people proving great things around you. You, you think that everything is possible. And so, uh, and so I was not uh, um, 
shaken, and uh, I, I actually tried to build a counterexample. I couldn't, um, um, and but I, I managed, nevertheless, to show that. Uh, so you know, I was also, I was trying to show the converse. Maybe you know, if you know the lemma, then you can prove. Uh, I couldn't do that. We'll, we'll see later. Uh, but I managed to show that the converse holds, uh, and in fact. Uh, there is a, a, you can formulate a version of the Lemmer conjecture uh, in, uh, in, in a non-commutative setting. Um, and uh, the miracle is that sort of this works, so it's actually easier in the non-commutative setting, so in, by, by which I mean in the semi-simple setting. So, so you, here you, you take a, a set S of uh, finitely many uh, matrices over the algebraic numbers, and you define what I call here a kind of non-commutative Mahler measure. So it's, it's um, uh, you, so this set is in Q bar, so you take all different places, all different Galois conjugates of your set, and uh, you raise your, power, your set to the power n, and you take the uh, maximal operator norm of an element of that set. So, okay, you have s, s to the n, look at the, um, the operator norm of this finite set of matrices s to the n, look at the maximal operator norm, and I call this norm of s to the n sub v. v is the place, uh, the Galois conjugates that you look at, and, and um, take the power n, and take the limit here. So this, this is sometimes called the joint spectral radius of your finite set of matrices. It has been studied by many people. It's called the joint spectral radius of the finite set. If S is just one, if S is one uh, matrix, you see that it's just the spectral radius of that matrix. Okay? So, um, so here, if you have just one matrix, then this M sub S is the product of all places of the spectral radius of your matrix. Okay? So, so it's basically the height. If you take the log, this is what's called the height uh, of the eigenva eigenvalues of your matrix. Um, and so uh, the theorem is, is that for this quantity, uh, there is a lemma uh, uh, conjecture, and it's actually true that the M sub S is bounded away from one uniformly. Um, and, but this, under an assumption, which is that the group generated by S is not solvable. So this uses the, um, so for example, in SL2R, in SL2C, if the subgroup is Zariski dense, then you have, you have this. If you, if you are solvable, then you're back in the lemma problem that <coughs> from before, and, and then uh, it's, uh, it's not, not, not clear. Okay, so, so this uses some uh, algebraic, uh, so some arithmetic geometry, but fortunately, it's somehow much easier than the lemma problem. Um, right, so, so as a corollary, you get that this uniform growth conjecture is in fact true, in all cases where the group generated by S is not solvable up to finite index. Okay, so surprisingly, it's a solvable case, which is harder. Okay, so remains, remains a solvable case. Um, and, okay, so for, for many years, I, I just had no clue how to do that. And uh, I got Peter uh, interested in this problem and, uh, and we, we, we actually showed uh, what I was hoping for for quite a while, th namely that um, you can, this, uh, in this particular example of two by two matrices, um, you can actually prove a converse. So um, this upper bound is the upper bound I was talking about before. Uh, you can prove a converse, which is that the uh, rate of growth <coughs> is bounded below by a function of the Mahler measure only. So we have an exponent here, which is probably not optimal, but never mind. It's, it's the, the point is that, uh, uh, so now you have this equivalence. So um, if, if you know the Lemmer conjecture, then this is bounded away from, from one, and therefore uh, the, the rate of growth is bounded away from one. And so in this particular example, this shows that the uniform growth conjecture is true, modulo the lemma conjecture, in fact equivalent for this example. Uh, but if you do a little, bit, a little bit of group theory, you can actually reduce every solvable group to this example. 
and so you can so this sort of completes the the, the picture. So if you if you know the lemma conjecture, you understand this example, and in fact you can um, taking a suitable uh, group quotient, you, you you can get that all solvable subgroups have uh, um, growth bounded away from zero, from one, and so you have this equivalent. So the two we know now that the two are equivalent. And uh, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to explain uh, uh, what's behind this, in particular the, the lower bound here. Um, yeah, so, so maybe uh, just uh, as an aside, uh, here is uh, a consequence of our theorem. It's, it's, it isn't, um, uh, it, it's not the way people are going to prove the limo conjecture, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's an equivalent statement. So it's, if you, um, so you, you see here that uh, if you assume lemma, then this is bounded away from zero. And so this means that, uh, this means that if you, if you pick an algebraic number, then either it's a root of unity, and this row, row is one, or it's not, uh, and then this is bounded away from one, okay? So, um, so this means that if you have too many relations between these polynomials, then it must be a root of unity, okay? So it, it's, a, it's a bunch of uh, equations and, uh, that, that imply on the number that imply that you are a root of unity. So you can, you can, if you, you can take, this, so these equations are over Z and you, you, you can reduce mod P if you want. And, and so, as a, as a result, you get that this lemma conjecture is actually completely equivalent to a counting problem in finite fields. So, uh, and the counting problem is this. So, there, there exists epsilon. It's going to be the same epsilon as in the lemma. Uh, and there are functions p of n and omega of n, such that uh, for every prime number bigger than p of n and every, uh, every residue mod p, um, if the order, the multiplicative order of x is larger than this function of n, then, uh, then um, the number of elements you, you, you get, uh, so sx to the n is, is, is basically the, the, the number you get, the numbers that you get by, you start with, um, start with zero, you apply, you do plus one or minus one, uh, uh, or you basically do plus one or multiply by x, or plus one or multiply by x, and, and you count how many elements you get this way. Each time you, you, you have to choose if you multiply by x or you add one. And, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, so this has to be, have exponential growth. The, yeah. So it's really, there is a related problem, which um, is uh, how fast can you, can you get all of the, the z mod pz uh, starting uh, from one and applying at each step a translation by one and a multiplic multiplication by x. So it's uh, very related to, to this issue. There is actually a nice paper of Konyagin on this issue. Um, okay. Um, yeah, actually, the uh, sort of uh, sad thing about this is that um, the hard part is uh, going, f is showing the equivalence. So um, the easy part is to, sh is to show that if you know this, you can prove the Lemer conjecture. So, so okay. Um, so what about the proof? Yeah, so you, you can make them uh, pretty much explicit uh, uh, using some different considerations. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't remember what it, what it is exactly, but here it's... Uh, um, yeah, yeah, I can get back to you. Yeah. Um, okay, so now how to lower bound this growth rate of S lambda? So, so here is a very naive way, which is actually the way the way is done for the way it is done in the non-solvable case. So you 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 pick a Galois conjugate of modulus bigger than one, you and you take a power of it. At some point, it's going to, it's going to have um, modulus strictly bigger than two. But now, if if you have um, modulus strictly bigger than two, then these two uh, these two uh, affine transformations they generate a free semigroup. It's kind of a ping pong argument. It's just all it's a it becomes a dissociated set. So there is no relation. Okay, so this way you get the lower bound on the growth. But of course, the problem is that it may take a long time for k, for the powers of lambda to be, 
bigger than two. No? If lambda is close to the unit circle, it takes a long time to get there. And in fact, uh, it's a really serious problem because you can find it's not very difficult. You can come up with a sequence of algebraic numbers such that in, in uh, lambda n, such that in the ball of radius n, s lambda n to the n, you cannot find any pair. They all have a relation. There is no free semigroup. You can't, you, so you, you, you're not going to solve the problem this way. So you, you need another way to, to estimate, to lower bound the, the growth uh, of, uh, of that set, of the powers of that set. And the idea is to use entropy. <coughs> So, uh, okay, so now I'm, I'm going to, to talk about this. And, uh, so, um, so the entropy of a certain random variable. So which random variable? It's going to be this one. Uh, so uh, you, here you, you take uh, um, a sequence of uh, IID variables with uh, coin flips into plus minus one uh, with probability of half each. And, and you look, uh, you, and you add, so xi, xi notes and xi not times lambda, xi not lambda squared, and so on. Uh, so the, 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 su the, support, the support of this um, probability measure, so it's a probability measure on the complex numbers, and so the support is precisely this uh, ball of radius n, so the, in fact, the, the, um, in the, the part in the upper, left, upper right corner of the matrix. Uh, so, so it has the same size, the support has the same size as uh, s lambda to the n. So if we are to lower bound the, the, the size of that set, we, we can just lower bound the entropy because the entropy is less than the log of the size of the support. Okay. Uh, yeah, so in particular, the asymptotic entropy H sub lambda is uh, less or equal to the weight of course. So, um, yeah, so this is what we actually show. We show that the asymptotic entropy is bounded below by this uh, Malle measure to some power. So, so in fact, this asymptotic entropy is, again, is uh, in between. It's completely controlled by the Malle measure. So this is related to Bernoulli convolutions, uh, as Peter mentioned uh, earlier this morning. Uh, so the Bernoulli convolution is just the infinite sum of, uh, of this, uh, so the, the limit of this sequence of, of uh, random variables. And it converges, of course, when lambda has modulus less than one. Uh, so, w w what are the very important properties of a Bernoulli convolution? So, one of the key properties is that it is self-similar. So, if you take uh, this, my, if you chop the, this um, infinite series up to, um, up to uh, the time n, then you see that the infinite series is actually equal to this ch uh, truncated, uh, so this was the sequence of random variables I was looking at before, plus a rescaled copy of your infinite sum, okay? So this is just uh, independent copies. So I'm going to sketch the, the proof, okay? How do you get a lower bound on this entropy? So um, we, we are trying to get a lower bound on the entropy of x to the n. Okay, so because of this infinite series, you, you can discretize your, yeah, you can, you can discretize by lambda to the end, and you see that if you know if you know what happens, if you know the first n digits, if you know what happens up to time n, then you know the infinite series with an error lambda to the n because it's a convergence series, so you basically understand what's going on. So this means that the, the entropy of this infinite uh, series, the, the, which is a measure on the complex plane, uh, at the scale lambda to the n is basically the Shannon entropy of these discrete random variables, which we are trying to estimate. So uh, this we can, we can 
split as a sum, we can look at so the nice thing about entropy is that we can understand the ent entropy contribution. We can sort of decompose the entropy into a sum of entropy contributions at each scale. Okay, and so uh, uh, we do this. So this means that the, the entropy, this is the entropy contribution, knowing what's happening at that scale. Um, and um, so, uh, so if you uh, write down this uh, self, you use the self-similarity here to, to say that this is uh, the same thing, it's just this convolution um, here. And, and, and then uh, I'm going to use a, a very nice property of the entropy, which is that the entropy of a sum is bigger than the entropy of each of the parts. So this is a kind of uh, very nice uh, thing that uh, entropy increases under when you take the sum. So you can actually just forget about the first part here and you get this. But this, you see, uh, I can rescale everything and all these terms here are actually the same because I've just rescaled by lambda to the i minus one. So they're all the same, so it's n times this, this entropy. Okay, so, but this entropy is still sort of somewhat mysterious because it depends on uh, the infinite uh, series. But again, by, by this property that the entropy of a sum is bigger than the entropy of, of each part, I can just be very dumb and, 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 and take just uh, uh, lower bounded by the first digit, okay, the first digit. And this is a very simple quantity to compute, it's just a minus plus minus one uh, uh, random variable, so, uh, so I can easily compute this, it's basically log lambda. So the outcome is that uh, the, when I take the limit here, divide by n, take the limit, I get that the, um, the, the limit entropy, h sub, little h sub lambda, is bigger, is bigger than some constant time log lambda. Okay, so that's, that's a sum lower bound. Okay. It's good, but it's, it's not enough because we want something more. We want that it's lower bounded by the, 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 the Mahler measure. Okay. So, so, yeah, so in particular, you see if, if lambda goes to one, this goes to zero, we don't want this. We want something just in terms of the Mahler measure. So the idea is to perform this analysis in multi-dimension multi by looking at the geometric embedding of, of lambda into, into C to the D. And, and, and um, so you have D, D conjugates, you, D will be the number of conjugates that lie inside the unit circle. And, and, and you hope to, to get this, so there, 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 is, there are two problems with this uh, strategy. The first one is that, uh, well, we want an estimate that which is independent of D, right? So we usually, when you do analysis in, in C to the D, well, you, we need to be careful that, uh, you know, your constant don't depend on the dimension and so on and so forth. So, so, so here it's, it's uh, you have to t take this into account and be, be careful that it does not depend on D. The answer, and the second issue is uh, it's not clear how di to discretize a set to 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 look at this. So the sketch I, I just did for you in the one-dimensional situation, you 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 look at uh, you discretize by lambda to the n by okay by intervals of size lambda to the n. But here, well, how do you do discretize a set? So there's no canonical way. Are you going to just take a grid and no? So it doesn't seem to work this way. So the the, somehow, the, um, technically, the, 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 what m makes the, the, the analysis work is, is that there's the use of multivariate ga Gaussians. So instead of discretizing by using some kind of grid, uh, we, we use this, uh, we define this uh, discretized entropy here as uh, the, um, we take a Gaussian, a normalized Gaussian in RD, which we can deform in uh, any way we want by some, some matrix. So we can choose, uh, we can, and then tune later the um, covariance, the matrix of variance and covariance of the matrix. And, and, and um, so, so this H here now is a differential entropy because this is now a continuous, uh, continuously supported uh, measure on RD. And, but this is going to play the role of uh, what I had before, this uh, H, uh, this, uh, this, this thing here. Okay, so, um, and, uh, but in order to, to prove this, um, th that the entropy of a sum, for example, is bigger than the entropy of each part, 
then uh, there is a key property here, uh, which is called the submodularity of the entropy. So you, you need to prove the, the same sort of estimates for, for this quantity here. And, and, uh, and, um, and so yeah, there is a key estimate, which is this fact here, which is in quite a uh, nice thing. So it, it's, uh, it can be seen as a kind of uh, entropy analog of this Plunicker, Rouge, uh, um, some set estimates in additive combinatorics. Uh, there is a, um, okay, so, yeah. Um, so, so the idea then is to, to tune this A. So there is, there is a, a very nice, there is a very well-known theorem of Horn, which tells you that if you, are, uh, if you have a, a set of, uh, of numbers and you look for a matrix, Who's with prescribed absolute uh, prescribed eigenvalues and prescribed singular values, then there, there is a uh, there is a relation. That, so there is there is an obvious relation between uh, the singular values and and the uh, um, eigenvalues of a, of a matrix. There's some inequalities that has to be satisfied, and Horn's theorem says that if these inequalities are satisfied, then there is uh, 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 a matrix with uh, that. Uh, uh, set of singular values and that set of eigenvalues. So here, the, the matrix will will be um, will be the, ha, will have eigen, eigenvalues the the, the, con the conjugates of your of your number, and uh, what's important is that um, it will it ha it will have operator norm, operator norm at most one, and and um, and so this can be do can be done using uh, the, this. Uh, uh, Horn theorem uh, that, in, in fact, we can prescribe all the uh, singular values to be one except for one, and and when you perform this analysis later, then you see realize that this what comes up here, uh, you can tune your matrix A using this uh, result of Horn to uh, to make sure that what shows up is precisely the determinant of the matrix and therefore just the product of the eigenvalues, and you, you get this way the Mahler measure. But there is some constant that uh, shows up, so it's, this constant has to be optimized. There's this, then a calculus exercise that has to be solved, and we have this 0 0.44 um, uh, at the end. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to, to talk about uh, Bernoulli convolution when the parameter is real. Okay. Um, so this is a very well studied, uh, very uh, long problem, uh, a very uh, well known uh, question, to uh, which goes back to Erdos, which is to understand when is this uh, law, when, when is this uh, Bernoulli convolution singular, uh, when is it absolutely continuous with respect to uh, Lebesgue measure. Okay, so here lambda is just a parameter between zero and one, and so um, it's all real. <coughs> so it's uh, by self-similarity, it's uh, classical to see that it's either singular or absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. Um, if lambda is between zero and one half, it's clear that it's singular because it's supported on the Cantor set. Okay, uh, if lambda is one half, then it's just Lebesgue measure, it's just uh, decomposition into digits of a, of a, of a number um, in, 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 uh, in base two. And, and Erdos observed that if uh, the strange phenomenon that for certain numbers, uh, so you know, it could, could be expected that between one half and one, they are all, this is always absolutely continuous, but that's not the case. And if, you, if lambda inverse is a piezo number, so, all the conjugates are inside um, uh, the unit disk, then, then it is singular. So in fact, the um, Fourier transform uh, is not in L1. So, um, yeah, so what's known about this, so um, Erdos proved that uh, this is back in the 40s and 50s, so that L mu lambda is absolutely continuous with uh, for Lebesgue almost lamb almost every lambda near one. So there is some interval where it's, that's true. This was um, improved. This was uh, yeah, pushed by Solomiak in the 90s. He showed that the, this is true for the in entire interval 
almost every is um, absolutely continuous. And there was a recent breakthrough in this uh, subject uh, by Hochmann and uh, pushed by Schmerkin. They showed that uh, the, um, the set of singular lambda has Hausdorff dimension zero. So it's a very tiny set. So in, in, uh, in this paper, Hochmann uh, proved uh, a formula for the dimension of the, uh, the, me the, the measure. So he showed, um, yeah, so you know, if you want to show that something is absolutely continuous, maybe it's a good idea to first be able to show that the dimension is one, okay? Uh, so it's on the real line, so yeah. Um, so he showed that, that um, that, for example, for, for algebraic numbers uh, or for, for transcendental numbers that uh, are not too well approximated by so, some algebraic numbers which in a way that which I'm going to say, that then the dimension is equal to the minimum of one and this asymptotic entropy divided by log lambda inverse. So the upper bound here is easy. What's difficult is the lower bound. That you want to show the dimension is large. So uh, I'm going to introduce the, the set E sub n. It's a set of polynomials of degree at most n and coefficients in w minus 1, uh, 0, and 1. Uh, so remember, this, this is precisely the set of polynomials for which uh, two of these sums uh, can be equal. Okay, so if, if two of these sums are equal, then my lambda belongs to this set E sub n. And the Diophantin condition is that there, there exists a, a sequence for every n, there exists a polynomial in, in like that, such that P sub n of lambda um, tends to zero exponentially fast, but it's not zero. And so, um, As a corollary, so Hochmann, uh, in, so using this result, he, he shows that um, there is a completely uh, number theoretic uh, conjecture, uh, which if true, implies dimension one, uh, basically for every transcendental number. And, and the conjecture is the following, that so, so you have this set here, you look at all roots of all these polynomials, all the roots of all these polynomials. So how many polynomials do you have? You have, you, you know, it's minus one, zero, one, so you, I don't know, you have three to the n polynomials. So you, you expect that you have uh, exponentially, so you, so you look at all the roots, you have basically exponentially many roots, so you, you would expect that they are exponentially separated, okay? So that, that, that any two of them, there is some constant, maybe 10, maybe a million, so that any two of them is, is the distance between 82 is bigger than one over this constant to the n. Um, the, it's, the, so this, this is not known, so if it were known, this would be wonderful, um, but uh, the current, I mean the, I guess the best known bounds are basically go back to Mahler and they are the form one over n to the power n, so it's not exponential. Yeah, that's for every n. That's why you, yeah, that's, yeah. So, uh, okay, so now I'm going to present a slightly different um, criterion of a similar flavor in a sense, um, which, uh, we, which is recent, uh, basically, ongoing work with uh, Peter. And uh, we, we show that if the dimension is strictly less than one, then in fact, lambda must have, must admit extremely good algebraic approximations. So, so here it's not for every D, it's for arbitrarily large D, but we get an explicit form of that, uh, that uh, we, we basically get a transcendence measure um, for, for the, the um, an explicit estimate on the transcendence measure. So we, we show that you know, if, if, la if your lambda is singular, if the dimension is less than one, then it must be that you have 
uh, an infin infinite, uh, an infinite sequence of approximations, all belonging to this set ED, but with the additional property that they are also singular. And they approximate your number very extremely well, x to the minus d to the n. So, um, so it's quite rare for, for a transcendental number to, to have such approximations. Um, so if you look at the literature in, in transcendence uh, number theory, uh, you see that it, it's known, for example, that most uh, classical constants like, uh, you know, um, uh, rational power of, of pi or, or a rational power of E, uh, all of this, they, they, um, they do not satisfy that. So, so in particular, this, this means that we have concrete transcendental numbers like these numbers for which we know that the dimension is one. Okay. Um, uh, another consequence of this is you see that the set of algebraic singular lambda is dense in the set of singular lambdas. So because every, if lambda is singular, you can, you can approximate it by singular guys, algebraic singular guys, okay? Um, so here's, a, again, another corollary, which just is clear from, from what I, I just said. Uh, so the, you remember the set of Piso numbers so Salem showed in the 1940s that the set of Piso numbers is closed. It's a closed set of the real numbers. Uh, it's countable, but it's closed. And, and so, um, so if you believe this conjecture that, that hasn't been disproved so far, that the only possible counterexamples to Erdős's conjecture are the inverse Piso numbers, then... Um, uh, if you, so if you can check this conjecture for algebraic numbers, then you, you have it for, for all numbers, okay? And the, the, the yeah, so, so, why, so why, why, is it, why, do, why is it interesting? Because somehow for algebraic numbers, there is this formula for Hochmann that tells you that the dimension is exactly what the dimension is in terms of this asymptotic entropy which is a, just a counting thing. It's a, you're counting algebraic numbers and see what the, what's the number of, of um, uh, you basically see what, what, what this algebraic entropy is. The, the, um, you're counting how many coincidences there can ha that can happen when you uh, write this, uh, these sums of plus minus one lambda to the i. Um, so, so it's basically a counting problem in, in, in number fields. So um, that, uh, yeah, so. Okay. Um, and so here is another corollary which follows from this theorem and from Hochmann's formula. Uh, so if you assume, so let me go back to Hochmann's formula here. If you, if you assume Lemmer's conjecture and you combine it with the previous theorem that uh, the, the lower bound on h sub lambda in terms of the Mahler measure, you see that h sub lambda is bigger than the log of the Mahler measure. So if you assume, if you assume uh, lemma, you know that the log of this Mahler measure is bounded away from, from, from zero, so you know that this h sub lambda is bounded away from zero, which means that whenever lambda is close enough to one, this blows up, it becomes bigger than one. So the dimension is one, okay? So, um, so yeah, so if you, assume lemma, then you get that in some interval near one, every algebraic lambda is, uh, is, uh, has dimension one, and because of this uh, new re approximation result, you get, in fact, that all numbers are, have dimension one, if you assume lemma. So, so it's kind of a funny situation where we have uh, two different number theoretic uh, so conjectures that uh, look uh, different and they both imply uh, something that we would like to, to, to see, but uh, in a different way. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so this is basically what I just said. So this basically reduces the dimension problem to algebraic numbers where um, uh, via, 
if you assume, yeah, if you see Hoffman's, Hoffman's formula, the question is basically reduced to evaluating a discrete entropy uh, for algebraic numbers. And I should mention that there, there is a recent work also uh, in this direction uh, by Peter himself uh, that goes further in the algebraic case. So in the algebraic case, Peter is able to actually show in many cases when lambda is close enough to one that uh, your measure is not, not only has dimension one, but is, uh, is absolutely continuous. Um, yeah, so, so maybe I should have said, yeah, so this uh, work of Hochmann, this work uh, uh, of Peter here, and, and this new theorem, they very much uh, rely on ideas that uh, Jean developed in this sum product, discretized sum product theorem, and these, so it's essentially the, what the engine behind is a, um, uh, entropy increase estimate for when you convolve two measures, uh, you want to, to show that the entropy has to increase in a way unless something uh, uh, very rigid happens. So um, I think it's basically the end of my talk.